Hello everyone and welcome back to Everything is Relative with me Mr. K where today we'll be doing a crash course on the topic of nuclear physics for Cambridge A-level physics subject code 9702. Now nuclear physics is not something that's usually taught at a high school level or at IGCSE at least not in detail. Uh, this topic usually follows quantum physics but you will notice as we go through this crash course that it's quite different from the topic of quantum physics. So luckily for us, as the name suggests, nuclear physics is the study of the nucleus. And we're going to discuss how the energy in, this, in the nucleus can be released in nuclear reactions and nuclear power stations and so on. Now the first thing you learn in nuclear physics should be a novel concept. And this is the concept of mass defect. Now we all know what a mass is, but a mass defect is slightly different. And before we get to that, we have to define a quantity, or actually revisit a quantity that we already know, the atomic mass unit. Now this atomic mass unit is given the symbol U, and this atomic mass unit by definition is a twelfth of the mass of carbon-12. So if I take carbon-12, a carbon-12 atom, place it on a balance, I'm exaggerating of course, but place the carbon-12 atom on the balance, get a mass. If I take that mass and divide it by 12, I should get the atomic mass unit U. Okay, and so it turns out that one atomic mass unit U is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kg. So remember, we can write carbon-12 as the symbol for carbon is C, 12 nucleons, 6 of those are protons. So the number at the bottom, remember, is our atomic number, our proton number, and we have to be careful, the number on the top is not the number of neutrons, but is the nucleon number, it is the total number of protons and neutrons, total number of things that reside in the nucleus. And so 12 minus 6 is 6, and so there are 12 neutrons in the nucleus of the carbon. There are 6 neutrons, rather, in the nucleus of the carbon-12 atom. And so initially we thought all of these nucleons, the neutrons and protons, have the same mass, but it turns out that they don't. So roughly the mass of each is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kg, but we are going to show that they aren't actually the same. So if I draw a very poor, very basic idea of what a nucleus would be, a nucleus is the core of an atom, and inside this core we have, I'm just drawing a random atom, we have protons, and we have neutrons. So I'm going to draw an atom that has as many protons as neutrons. And so in red I've drawn neutrons, and in black I've drawn protons. This is what a nucleus looks like. Now if you want to add electrons whizzing around this, classically, of course, electrons whizzing around this nucleus, that's fine, but this is nuclear physics. We are, for now at least, only concerned with the nucleus. And so this entire object is the nucleus of an atom. And these things, protons and neutrons, have mass. It turns out that their mass is not identical. It's very similar, but not identical. It turns out that the proton has a mass of 1.007276 atomic mass units. A lot of significant figures here. Okay, and the neutron has a mass of 1.008665u. So you can see it's very close to 1u. It's also very close to each other, but it's not. Okay. So the proton and the neutron, due to their quark combinations, don't have the same mass, and they also don't have a mass of one atomic mass unit exactly. And then our old friend, the electron, is nearly negligible in mass, 0 
0.549 atomic mass units. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, what this means is, firstly, the mass of carbon-12, let me write carbon-12 as such. Remember, carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons, right? So what do I expect? I expect the mass to be 12u. So if I, mass, if I measure the mass of carbon-12, if I place carbon-12 on, on a balance, I'm going to get 12 atomic mass units, which is fine. But surely the mass of carbon-12 is equal to 6 times the mass, the mass of the carbon-12 nucleus, rather. We'll ignore the electrons again. It's 6 times the mass of a proton plus 6 times the mass of a neutron. There's 6 protons and 6 neutrons in the carbon-12 nucleus. Let's do this calculation. Since we have these masses, that's 6 times the mass of a proton, which we said was 1.007276 atomic mass units, plus 6 into 1.008665 atomic mass units. Adding these together, we should get 12. Well, clearly you can see this is number is going to be greater than 12. It turns out to be 12.095646 atomic mass units. We'll keep the same number of decimal places. This number is not 12. Greater than 12. Ah, something's amiss. Is it the number of decimal places we've used? Well, no, immediately we can see that 6 times 1 plus 6 times 1 will give us 12, but we don't have 1s here. We have numbers larger than 1. We are, to get, we are going to definitely get a mass that's greater than 12. Hmm. What does this mean? This means the mass of the nucleus is greater than the mass of the, or the mass of the nucleons, rather. The individual nucleons is greater than the mass of the nucleus as a whole. Hmm. Now, this is something that's novel. This is not usual. Why is the whole less than the sum of its parts? Okay. Now, we define this quantity, mass defect. We define this quantity, mass defect, as... the mass of the nucleons minus the mass of the nucleus, a bigger number minus a smaller number. And so for this carbon-12 atom, this was 12.095646 minus 12, which leaves us with 0 0.095646 atomic mass units. The mass defect of a, nu of a nucleus by definition, is the difference between the total mass of the nucleons and the combined mass of the nucleus. So that's by definition. You need to learn the definition of what a mass defect is, not just understand how to calculate it. Why is this important? And where does this mass disappear to? Einstein said, said something very special. It's an equation that everybody knows. Not many people know exactly what it means. So Einstein did say that E is equal to mc squared. This equation is known as the mass-energy equivalence. Weirdly enough, this explanation that I'm writing now explains it a lot better than the equation does. A mass-energy equivalence is what this equation is. Mass and energy are basically two forms of the same thing. Or even better way to say it is mass is a form of energy, as kinetic energy is, as potential energy is. This is slightly different, but any object with mass has an equivalent energy E associated with that mass. Aha! So now I'm beginning to see 
something that might make sense. So the reason why we have a mass defect for a nucleus, the reason why a nucleus is lighter than the sum of its parts, is because, if we go back to what Einstein says, if I take all these nucleons and I put them together in the nucleus, I get a lighter mass, but that mass that is lost, quote-unquote, is transferred into energy, because inside the nucleus we have the strong force. And so the energy is the energy stored by the strong force, the energy between the nucleons, the energy that is used to store the nucleons in the nucleus. And binding energy is a new concept as well. The definition of binding energy is the energy required to separate all the nucleons in a nucleus. Aha! So, this binding energy, this new concept, is equal to the mass defect multiplied by c squared, mc squared, energy is mc squared. Okay, so now I'm understanding what this means. This means that the mass that I lost, the 0 0.095646, wasn't actually lost. It was stored as energy inside the nucleus to keep the nucleons together. If I want the mass to be returned to the nucleons, I have to separate them from the nucleus. I have to give them zero energy. I want them to just line up outside the nucleus. So I have to provide the energy equivalent of this mass. If I apply the energy equivalent of that mass from Einstein's equation, ah, then I can separate all the nucleons from the nucleus and line them up but they are no longer together, no longer held by, by the strong force. Okay, so now I'm seeing where this is leading. Um, this is great, but remember, I want to measure binding energy in MEV, mega electron volts. Okay, and I want to measure mass defect in atomic mass units. So I'm going to need unit of measurement for C squared. And so, from here I can see that the measurement the unit of measurement is going to be MeV per atomic mass unit. Okay, but what is this value C squared? I can't use meters per second and then square that because I'm going to get an answer in joules, which I don't really want. We're dealing with small particles here, right? So this is why your teacher would be stressing that joules are great, but they don't work so well on the nuclear scale, on the, on the scale of atoms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation, E is equal to mc squared, and I'm going to find the energy that exists for one atomic mass unit. So that's 1u, I'm going to find the, the energy that's associated with one atomic mass unit, 1u, and we know that 1u is 1 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kg for every atomic mass unit. Multiply this by c squared, 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second squared. That'll give me an answer in joules. Great. I don't want an answer in joules. I want an answer in mega electron volts. You'll see the mega becomes apparent later on. Okay. Now, if I want an answer in mega electron volts, I take my answer in joules and divide it by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 to go from joules to mega electron volts. To go to, to electron volts, rather. To go to mega electron volts, I have to divide by a further 10 to the power 6. Aha! So, after doing this, I find, and in Cambridge we're working with three significant figures for all our constants, and so what I get is 934 mega electron volts. So the energy associated with one atomic mass unit is 934 mega electron volts. What this means is that C squared is 934 mega electron volts for every atomic mass unit U. 
OK. I see where this is going. So if we go back to our example for carbon 12, 12, 6 for carbon 12, the lazy physicist is coming out. I'm not going to write binding energy. I'm going to write it as BE, BE binding energy. Binding energy is MC squared. This is the mass defect, 0 0.0. 95646 atomic mass units U, but energy we want in mega electron volts, so we're going to multiply it by 934 mega electron volts for every atomic mass unit. Ah, we are left with an answer in mega electron volts 89.3 mega electron volts. This is the binding energy. For carbon 12. What does that mean? That means if I have a nucleus of a carbon 12 atom, there's six protons and six neutrons inside this nucleus. So let's just draw one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm just drawing it randomly. And then six neutrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, three classical depiction, but you get the idea. If I were to break apart this nucleus and free all of these particles to infinity, infinity meaning a distance in which the strong force is no longer going to act on these particles, and there's no other interactions between them, if I remove them, the energy that I require to do so or the energy that I use in doing so will be 89.3 mega electron volts. So that's the amount of energy that was being held inside the nucleus when the nucleons were attached together by the strong force. That's all the binding energy means. It's the energy that's being held in the nucleus, also the energy required to then break the nucleons free from the nucleus. So the last quantity that we can discuss is binding energy per nucleon. Binding energy per nucleon. Binding energy per nucleon is simply the binding energy, 89.3 in the case of carbon-12, divided by the number of nucleons, number of protons plus neutrons, which is 12. This gives a binding energy of, per nucleon of 7.44 mega electron volts. Now why is it that we want the binding energy per nucleon? Well it turns out the binding energy per nucleon varies a lot less than the binding energy. The binding energy varies across small and large atoms quite significantly, whereas the binding energy per nucleon doesn't range between too many values. And so if we draw a graph of binding energy per nucleon against the nucleon number, we get a very interesting shape. This is what the shape looks like. So here's a graph of binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts against the nucleon number, the number of nucleons. Now I'm going to label the parts on this graph. You can see this shape is quite weird. It's very steep and rising initially. As we get to heavier nuclei, where the nucle number of nucleons is over, let's say, 20 or 30, we reach a peak, and then the graph slowly begins to dip again. Now, this is just a sketch. It's a rough sketch. It's not meant to be accurate, but the shape is important. So I'll label three points A, B, and C. So basically what happens is the point B is the point of the most stability. So the most stable nuclei are those with the highest binding energy per nucleon. The binding energy per nucleon being high simply means more energy is required to break apart the nucleus, which means those atoms are the most stable. The lower end of nucleons, where your hydrogens and heliums and so on, believe it or not, these are not very stable. Hydrogen will fuse to become helium. So lighter atoms are also not very stable. Heavier atoms, like uranium, for example, plutonium, 
are also not very stable. They are not stable because the number of protons are very high. And if you have a lot of protons, then you have an outward or repelling electrostatic force, which is going to counteract the strong force, at least somewhat. And so the ideal Goldilocks zone would be somewhere around B, somewhere around iron. Iron is the most stable nucleus. In the lower part of the graph, moving from A towards B, we have nuclear fusion, our lighter elements fusing to become heavier elements, which we'll discuss a little later on. Going from C to B, we have nuclear fission, when heavier elements try to become more stable and split into lighter elements. So everything at the end of the day wants to tend towards stability. They want to tend towards a state in which they will be more stable. And so that's where fission and fusion, which we'll discuss soon, can, can be seen. And so this is the graph of the binding energy per nucleon against the nucleon number. And you can see the shape is very specific. So the ideal place will be somewhere around B with the highest binding energy per nucleon, which means that those nuclei are the most stable. It's not to say that the nuclei at C are, less sta are not stable, but they are less stable. Okay, so let's talk about what we just discussed. Let's talk about nuclear fusion. Now, you may have heard this term, and probably more so recently. Fusion may be the power source of the future. It's green. It's clean. It's very difficult to achieve, though. What is fusion? Well, basically, you might be able to get a sense of it if you are well, reading your notes, reading your textbook, uh, preparing for tests, exams. But fusion is basically when we take a light nucleus and another light nucleus and we put them together under lots of pressure and at high temperatures and we get a nucleus that's heavier. Now, if we look back at our graph, light and light giving heavier means a higher binding energy per nucleon, which is what we want. We want to tend towards B, the point of, of stability. And so an example of this is what the sun does in its core. The sun takes protons, which we can write as 1H1, okay, the hydrogen atom with only a proton in it, with one nucleon, and fuses this and the tremendous amounts of energy, you can imagine the amount of energy at the core of the sun, fuses this with deuterium, H2, and this produces helium-3, which is released from the sun. But more importantly, what's evident to us immediately is the amount of energy. The amount of energy released is huge. The amount of energy is huge. So this proton with the pressure and the heat within the sun, fuses with deuterium to produce helium-3, and then energy in various forms. And this energy turns out is significant. Even though we are pushing things together, we are applying loads of energy to get these, these nuclei to fuse. When they do fuse, they produce a heav heavier nucleus and a lot of energy in the process. That energy is what we observe as heat and light from the sun. This is called a nuclear equation. Again, probably treated as a separate topic in the, in the syllabus, but we, here we kill two birds with a single stone. So this is a nuclear equation. We always want the nuclear equation to balance. And so basically what happens, as you can see, once this fusion occurs, if I were to cal calculate the mass defect or the mass, the atomic masses on either side of this equation, I'll notice that there'll be a mass defect on the right-hand side. And to accompany that mass defect, there must be some energy. Ah, and that's where the release of energy comes from, from the mass defect. Okay, so this is nuclear fusion. And more reading is definitely required. Again, this is just a crash course, but 
the more resources you get, the more you read up on this, the better your understanding will get. It's one of those topics that require external reading, watching a few videos, reading extra textbooks, but the applications are quite plentiful. Now, fission is different from fusion. In fission, we have a heavy nucleus that's not quite stable, or we induce it to be not quite stable. And this heavy nucleus, in an attempt to become more stable, will split and become a lighter nucleus, something roughly half the mass of the heavy nucleus, plus another lighter nucleus. And usually this is accompanied by some neutrons and some energy. Now, the lighter nucleus all depends on what's actually undergoing fission, and the number of neutrons also will be determined by the nucleus that is, that is decaying, that is undergoing nuclear fission, and then the energy release is also quite significant. Quite significant. So we said fusion is the process that happens within the sun, hopefully the source of, our, of power in the future, probably 50 years away at least. Fission is currently our process that we use in, in nuclear power plants, nuclear reactors, use nuclear fusion. How does this work? Well, in nuclear fusion, we take, I'm going to use uranium-235 as an example. Uranium-235 has 92 protons, and we bombard this uranium-235 with a neutron. And so what we have here is Uranium-235 plus a neutron, guess what? That becomes uranium-236. Now, uranium-235 is not unstable, but uranium-236 is much more unstable. And so what happens in an effort to regain stability, this uranium-236 splits and undergoes fission. And in that process, it, can fall, it will form lighter elements, some neutrons and some energy. Now, the lighter elements will vary. It's a random process. But let's take an example in which it undergoes fission and becomes barium-144. And krypton-89. In this process, in order to conserve the mass on either side of this equation, three neutrons are released and energy is released. Energy is released because, yet again, there's a mass defect. If there's a mass defect, there must be some energy to compensate for the mass defect on either side of this equation. So if I calculated the atomic mass of uranium, this neutron, barium, krypton, and the three neutrons, I'll notice that the left and right hand sides don't balance. Since they don't balance, energy must be added to keep the universe happy. Conservation of energy needs to be, needs to be followed. And so this is where the energy comes from. And it turns out that's the energy that we use to heat water, to create steam, turn turbines, and generate power in a nuclear power station, nuclear power plant. Okay, so this is, I'm just going to write it down, barium-144. It's an isotope of barium. This is an isotope of krypton, krypton-89. We, get, we may get different nuclei being formed in a fission, or different isotopes of the same nuclei, barium and krypton. And then we have three neutrons being formed as well. So this is a brief summary on fusion and, and fission. And fission can be used to generate power, like I said, but fission can also be used to generate atomic bombs. All nuclear bombs have some variation of nuclear fission, or use some variation of nuclear fission, including the very first that were ever created. So let's see a diagram on how exactly we can use fission to make a bomb, for example, or use it to generate power. And like magic, we have a very strange diagram. So basically, I've just drawn poorly, 
diagrammatically what, ha what was happening in what I explained above. Here I have uranium-235 in red, a neutron in black. A neutron is fired into the uranium-235, turning it into uranium-236. In the process, energy is released, barium and krypton, all of those things, we'll ignore them, and only concern ourselves with the other neutrons. Notice that three neutrons are released. Wait, what does that mean? That means each of these neutrons can then go and strike another uranium atom, make it unstable, and in the process, release another three neutrons. There are three neutrons there, three there, and three there. So after one, two fissions, I now have nine neutrons. I only started with one. If each fission is releasing significant energy, a significant energy increasing rapidly means a very significant energy. This is called a chain reaction. A chain reaction simply means that one neutron is exciting a uranium-235 atom. In the process, uranium-235 becomes unstable, gives off three neutrons. Those three neutrons go and strike other uranium atoms, and the process continues on its own. It doesn't require any external impetus. It just happens naturally. Since this process happens at an exponential rate, it increases exponentially, we call this an uncontrolled chain reaction. This is an uncontrolled. We aren't controlling the rate at which these reactions happen. Mathematics is controlling these, and it turns out the exponential increase in the number of neutrons produced is great, but the, number, the amount of energy produced is even more startling because we can generate a great amount of energy in, in no time at all. And that's the principle behind a nuclear bomb, an atom bomb, a bomb that works on fission. This is an uncontrolled chain reaction. Now, in a nuclear power plant, this doesn't happen. Uncontrolled chain reactions, like the name suggests, can't be controlled. And so we can't be certain of, or can't be certain we will be able to contain that amount of energy. So what do we do? We modify this picture very slightly as follows. Okay, so this looks similar, but not identical. I have a neutron coming in. I strike the uranium-235, make it unstable. In the process, the neutrons are released. But what do I do? I have these weird rectangular objects. These are called control rods, and they are usually made from boron. Boron's an element. Why do we use boron? Because boron is made or is a good absorber of neutrons. So of the three neutrons that are produced, one is absorbed, another is absorbed, I'm only left with one. So only one neutron can go forth and strike another neutron. So I still have a chain reaction, I still have one leading to another. After the second uranium atom is, has been struck, it will undergo fission, it will release three neutrons, but we have another boron control rod, and this will absorb two more neutrons and only allow one to continue. And so this pro process continues, I am controlling the rate of the reaction. If I control the rate of the reaction, then I have a much safer, much more linear, controlled release of energy. Only the energy that's of one coming from one fission event is being released each time. And so this, as you may believe, is called a controlled chain reaction. And these control rods exist in nuclear reactors. And so this process is what we use in a nuclear reactor. Notice that the processes are identical, besides the fact that we are very careful to control the rate of reaction. If we don't control our control rods, if we don't 
use the control rods in the right way, this reaction can very easily become uncontrolled. So that's the thing you would look out for if you were in charge of a nuclear reactor. You make sure that that doesn't happen. You make sure that only one fission event leads to only one other fission event. So that's fission, fusion, and then some applications of fission. Con uncontrolled chain reactions and controlled chain reactions. Same process, but with a little bit of manipulation, we can control the amount of energy we release. And we use that energy to, again, like I said, heat water, turn it into steam, and use the steam to turn turbines, like we do in any other power plant. Just that the amount of energy released with nuclear power is quite significant, and in a short amount of time as well. So is it dangerous? Yes. But is it powerful and is it energetic? Yes, those reactions are energetic and so useful to create power. Now something else that's quite important in this topic is radioactive decay. Again, you at some point may have heard of the phrase and have a vague understanding of what it is. Now the two things we know about radioactive decay is that radioactive decay is one spontaneous and two random. So random radioactive decay is a random process, meaning we cannot predict when a nucleus or which nucleus is going to undergo decay. And spontaneous means it doesn't really need any other external impetus. It'll happen on its own without anything or any external forces or any external stimulus to occur. Now, why does it happen? Or what is it? Well, radioactive decay is simple. An unstable nucleus or unstable nuclei emit radiation to become more stable. That's the entire point. That's very similar to what fission is. So if you are unstable and you want to become more stable, then you give off particles that are radioactive in order to regain stability. There are three types of radiation. The types that we will learn in the way, they are alpha particles. Again, you would have seen these in particle physics. Beta particles. and gamma rays. Alpha particles are simply helium nuclei, the nucleus of a helium atom moving very fast. Beta particles are fast moving electrons, or they also could be positrons. Electrons on their own don't seem very daunting. But when they move at the speed of beta particles, then they are quite harmful. And gamma rays are simply high-energy photons. So if a nucleus is not stable and wants to become more stable, it can spontaneous, spontaneously and randomly emit either an alpha particle, a beta particle, a gamma particle, or a combination of these. And in the process, the energy that's released with those particles allows the unstable nucleus to become more stable. So it turns out there's a relationship between the amount of a substance that is undecayed, radioactive substance that is undecayed, and the time through which it takes to decay. So let's look at a graph of nuclei that have been undecayed against time. So here we have a graph of a number of undecayed nuclei in a radioactive sample, this could be uranium or plutonium or any, or barium or krypton, any radioactive substance. And this graph has a very familiar shape. It's an exponential decay. Now, the initial amount of substance that I have, I'm going to call N naught. N naught is the number of nuclei that have un are undecayed when time t is equal to zero. What I notice is that there's a very special shape. 
the gradient of this graph is very steep initially, not so steep after some time, and much less steep as time goes on. Ah, so what this means is that the rate at which particles decay increase or decreases with, with time, but also increases with the number of particles present. So the more particles I have present, the more undecayed particles I have present, the quicker the rate of the decay. Aha, we, we met something like this, very similar to this, actually identical to this, in capacitance. Capacitors discharge quicker when they have a greater charge on them. Particles, or nuclei, decay quicker when they are more nuclei to decay. Now, we're going to define another quantity here. But if this is n naught, and I take n naught and I divide it by 2, the time it takes for half the particles in a substance to decay, we call the half-life of that substance the half-life of that nucleus. The longer the half-life, the more stable the particle is. It won't undergo that many decays in a long space of time. The shorter the half-life, the more radioactive the particle is. So n over 2, the time that corresponds to the, the substance decaying to half its initial number is the half-life. And half of that would be n naught over 4. And obviously that would be two half lives. So that's 2 t half. We give it the symbol t half for half life and so on. n over 8 will be the third half life and so on. And as we go on in time, this gradient smooths out and the rate of decay decreases. So although it's not required, I'm going to do a little bit of calculus for those that are interested. So the rate at which particles decay, undergo radioactive decay, is proportional to the number of particles present. The more particles I have present, the quicker they decay. But it's a decrease, so there's a minus sign. So I'm going to do, again, this is unnecessary for Cambridge, but I'm just going to do the derivation for those of you who are interested in the calculus and to make you happy. So d and dt is minus lambda n. This is a separable equation, meaning I can write this as dn by n equal to minus lambda dt. And obviously I can integrate this. I can integrate this from the original number of particles n naught to the final number n. That's dn by n minus lambda, which is a constant. I'm just using the constant to replace the proportionality. All right, so the constant doesn't really have a meaning just yet. And I'm integrating over time, 0 to t, and to make mathematicians happy, we'll call this dt prime. And so what I get is the log of n over n naught if I solve the integral and then evaluate immediately, is equal to minus lambda t. If I take e as the common base on both sides, I get e to the lin of anything is just that something. And so I get n is equal to n naught e to the minus lambda t. Aha! This is the equation that you've seen in your notes. This equation gives us the number of particles n at any time t. So if I know the original number, I know the time t, I can calculate what n is. And in this equation, lambda, it's not the wavelength here, it is called the decay constant. It is a special quantity. It is the decay constant it is the probability per unit time that a decay will occur. So it's units. I use square brackets for units. The units for lambda is second to the minus one per second. 
So this equation is very special. It looks just like the one in your formula sheet. X is x naught e to the minus k t. X is n, x naught is n naught, and k is lambda. It's the same equation. It's the same form, it's the same type as the capacitance discharge equation. Okay, so let me look at this equation again and try to find an expression for the half-life. You know, at the half-life, n is half the maximum value, half n naught. And then obviously this must equal to n naught e to the minus lambda t. So I'm just using the equation above. Now, and this time, when the number drops to half, the initial value is the, the half-life, t half. So what I get is e to the minus lambda times the half-life is equal to r half. And rearranging, I can solve for this time, this half-life, and I get the half-life turns out to be the natural log lin2 divided by lambda. Aha! So if I know the decay constant lambda, I can find the half-life of any substance. So the decay constant can be found from this graph. The greater the value for lambda, the quicker the decay will, will happen initially. The smaller the value of lambda, the more smooth this graph would be. Less probability of decay means smoother graph, less radioactivity, which makes sense. And so this is how we find an expression for the half-life. Now that was the, those were the only new quantities. We also learned, finally, we learned another quantity, which was called the activity. Now what is an activity? The activity was simply the number of decays per unit time. The number of decays happening every second. So if a radioactive substance is decaying 10 times per second, its activity is 10 per second. It's defined by a symbol A. We give it the symbol A and we define it as the decay constant lambda times n. Simple as that. This is lambda times n naught e to the minus lambda t. Again, just using the equation from above. And since we are lazy physicists, we write lambda n naught as the maximum activity a naught, a naught e to the minus lambda t. It has the same form as the number of undecayed nuclei n. It's an exponential decay. And as you can see, looking at the units, lambda is measured in per second, and so too is the activity. So the activity is measured in per second, but we give it a very special unit to differentiate it from hertz, for example. We call this unit for radioactive decay, for the activity of radioactive decay, the Becquerel, or symbol capital B and lowercase q. BQ stands for the Becquerel, and that's the unit for activity. So you can see we've sort of breezed through a lot of the important stuff which you have to read on your own, but this again was only meant as a crash course. And we introduced quite a few new concepts, although I do think it's a lot easier than quantum physics. It does require reading, understanding, and practice. Practice will help you understand how binding energy works, mass defects work, and how we can use them to determine how much of energy will be released in fission and fusion reactions. So until next time, I'm Mr. K, and this is Everything is Relative. See you.